This is a production of Cornell University. Um, okay, well, thank you guys for being here last. Um, so hopefully this won't be too painful. I'm having just as a um, warning my head, it feels super hazy right now, so I hope I make sense. <laughs> so don't hold, me, don't hold it against me. If, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it cool. Uh, so what I'm uh, been working on for the past three, almost four years now, is um, these uh, maze land races, uh, because they're like a really cool resource uh, for environmentally adaptive alleles. The way that I like to think about these land races is that uh, they're like incredibly diverse on their genotype uh, because they uh, have been collected across many years by tons of people thanks to their collaboration with Samuel Fox. Um, and they also have their representation within these uh, genotypes of their environmental diversity on which they have been grown. So that means that they present a really like a massive gold mine of uh, breeding resources for adaptive alleles. And that was basically the, the purpose of my PhD has been, how can we leverage these two things to uh, speed up breeding programs? So the uh, data that I'm working with is the Simit Mesa of this, uh, Seeds of Discovery uh, project. Uh, that is a collection of about 5,000 land races that have been collected all over uh, Latin America. I have been genotyped through GBS uh, markers. Uh, these have approximately like 50% missing data, as most GBS studies do. Uh, but you can impute them, and then you have like about 300,000 markers on our set. The cool thing about these uh, uh, land races is that I have been also uh, identified with the geographical information. So we have the environment. So from where they came from. So we know that, for example, some land races have a certain temperature uh, growth uh, or the soil pH or the frost frequency that it's been uh, applying some form of pressure of selection over the however many years the farmers have been keeping them on their location. And the combination of these two things is about 3,000 accessions. So it's like, how can we leverage those two uh, to get information out of them? And I just like to always show this plot because uh, it's just really amazing. I really like seeing it. The fact that it's where maize comes from, it's all over. And just the, the, the array of uh, conditions that it has been going through is just, we should be able to like mine that out to get adaptive alleles. So uh, what I want to do is just discover the beneficial allele side of them. The standard pipeline is you do some kind of genotyping, you do some kind of association model, and then you finally validate whatever you find through that. The standard way, you do some kind of scheme sequencing. You map that through a reference genome. You do variant calling, and then you impute the, uh, those things. That gives you the genotypes. That if you have some form of genotypes, then you can do the association model. But the problem always you have is that there's uh, some form of population structure or genetic architecture that is known in maize to exist. So you have to control for that. So that means that those uh, alleles that you might find associated through like an environmental GWAS or just a standard GWAS approach, uh, was going to give you some form of variant selection that then you have to validate, and then you finally have maybe some potentially causal alleles. Uh, and the way we do this on the data that we have is the standard pipeline just through uh, some GBS markers with eagle imputation, where we're using a combination of PCs, uh, geographical location, and a kinship matrix. So that gives me like six different kinds of uh, GWAS models to try and identify these things, and it actually works. Um, uh, there's a paper that already came out a couple of years ago on this, identifying uh, longitudinal attitude adaptation. Uh, but the problem, of course, is, or the sort of limitation that we have, is that this imputation is not perfect. So if we look at the correlation of the imputed alleles uh, with some uh, markers that we hide so that we can test for that, it's like a 0.6 uh, correlation, which, again, it works, but it can be better. Particularly when we think of an environmental GWAS model, where we're trying to explain the environment, uh, you have to control for the population structure. And we go from something where most of the genome looks significant to another one uh, where we try and control more finely for the population structure where nothing is. So how can we improve on this? Even if it works, you can do some form of uh, uh, selection of these uh, variants, then you can like mask it or test it against another set of uh, trials, for example. What can, imp what can we improve on that? Well, beginning on the first part, we can change it for like uh, just the simple fact that we have genotypes that are highly missing. We can improve that, and, and we've been talking about for a while in our lab of what is the practical haplotype, uh, practical haplotype graph on maize. 
which is a collection of mace assemblies that serve as a source for haplotypes to improve on the imputation of the data. So the missing data is reduced, and potentially we have more informative alleles or haplotypes. And on the other side is how do we do the variant uh, prioritization or validation. We're thinking of doing this sort of orthogonal validation to like map alleles on a different species, for example. And I'll be talking a little bit on both of these things. So how can we improve on that part of the genotyping? Well, we increase the diversity of the haplotypes. Uh, so I was really surprised about finding this paper on nature where uh, human geneticists are identifying that if you have a diverse set of people, you can actually identify better for um, the markers of the traits that can be correlating to that. And this came back in June this, uh, this year. So that's basically what we have on the land races. It's a set of like a diverse uh, population that we can hopefully use from to mind for better identifying these adaptive alleles. Now the other side is to map uh, orthogonally on a different, uh, for example, species so that we don't have the problem of it being uh, just this sort of uh, population structure, genetic architecture that can be variable. If it maps on a different species, hopefully then that means that we can actually test for a true causal variance. And on the side of the genotyping part, the mice uh, the haplotype graph, it's a database and a pipeline is a database of assemblies that serve as a source of haplotypes that we can then use to map breeds against and then give us our imputed haplotypes that then we can use to generate genotypes and test for association. And the way that this looks right now, <coughs> sorry, this is a collection of accessions and this is the number of what we're calling uh, genomic ranges, which is just the haplotype defined by a gene length. So in the case of maize, if there's 30 some thousand genes, you have 70,000 genomic ranges because it's broken by each uh, once you find a gene in it. And this is just the different accessions that we have in, in uh, the data we're working with right now for all of the 10 chromosomes. The ones that have just a couple chromosomes is because they're assemblies in process by uh, collaborators in our group. Uh, but it's just a really cool resource to be working with. So why do we think this is actually going to work? On the one side, we have that uh, the Maisland races so show a sizable portion of IBD regions. So some of the uh, assemblies that we have in the database right now are for some land races that CIMIL has sequenced. And over here, we can see that uh, out of 8,000 genic regions, about like 10, 20% of them are exactly the same. So if we sample enough of them, we could potentially just be having actually the haplotypes for each of these genic regions uh, that we can then use uh, scheme sequencing to match against, and that will give us information. But then if we have only the genic regions, how much can we actually explain? of any given phenotype. And apparently, uh, we can actually maybe, hopefully, map about 70% of the expression uh, control, uh, at least in the maize leaf that is coming out of uh, this paper that uh, uh, Pozok in our lab, Catherine, is working on. And it's actually a really cool, um, um, I'm sorry, my head, um, <laughs> analysis that they've been doing. Because this is a massive effort of 104 maze uh, transcription factors, and they're identifying that most of them actually bind nearby the genes. So there we have that uh, the genic regions should be potentially enough to explain most of the variation of any given expression that can be, can be associated to a particular trait. That did work. Okay. So how is this actually performing on our land races? I finally tested that. So we can compare the GBS SNP calls against the PHG. Uh, SNP calls, and it actually doesn't perform too bad. The problem is we will, of course, like to see this little diagram over here. Uh, this is from a, a distance matrix, so basically all com our comparisons like against uh, 4,000 and change uh, accessions. We would like it to be like a straight line, assuming that the GBS data is correct. Um, but then we have like this blob over here that is just actually identifying with a higher distance on the SNP calls from the BHG. So what we're thinking is that we're just simply missing the correct haplotypes in the database. So we need to increase that out. And how do we do that? Well, we increase the number of haplotypes in the database. And for that, the MACE community in general is assembling all of the NAMP founders. We're hoping to have those available early next year so that we can increase the source of uh, this genomic information. Also, additionally, in our lab, we'll be assembling uh, 25 additional CIMID uh, MACE lines which are inbred derived from land races that CIMIT has created across years. There's 500 of them right now. So we've selected a few of them to start to work with and generate more haplotypes that we can work on to improve the imputation of the land races. And in that sense, uh, 
we are trying several different assemblers in the lab. And uh, the cool thing is that it's working pretty neatly, at least on uh, uh, the haplotype level that we're thinking of a gene uh, sense. Because um, there's this tool that in the lab we developed that is called Tabasco. It's just mass, it's basically mapping the, the, gene, the CDS regions for the genes against the genome and how many of them we are actually to recover. We can identify how complete the genes are being assembled through it. And uh, we have that most of them are actually found in there. So we're pretty uh, hopeful that we should be able to have a working set early next year as well for the CMIS lines. And that's it. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone in the Buckler lab, because this is basically the work of everyone in there, both growing the plants to take the tissues and actually analyzing the data, because sometimes you don't know what you're doing, but you're doing it, and then like, you get there uh, eventually. So it's, it's really great. So uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> Oh, wait, we got a question. <laughs> no, you know, so, so you had that little blob and your, um, your assumption is that it had, those, those lines happen to have a lot of haplotypes that weren't captured in your panel. Correct. Do you, do you have other evidence to suggest that those are kind of uniquely diverse from the rest to kind of lead to that conclusion? So I haven't checked specifically the, um, the individual regions that were having problems for the land races, because the truth that we have is uh, it's incomplete, it's GBS data. We do have more information for some other lines as part of the um, Genomes to Field project, where they have like a whole genome sequence data that has better allele calls that we can test against that. And we can see that there are some specific genes where the errors are actually found in a subset of them. So this is specific regions of the genome where most of the errors are actually found. Do you want to men mention when you make the trees from those markers, what you see? Oh, yeah. So as part of the same thing, uh, trying to figure out what's going on, uh, I did some gene trees for the most uh, error-prone regions, and they tend to be the most diverse ones. So there's like the most with the most branches, the, the smallest uh, clusters. So that, that's telling us that we just basically, uh, we don't have representation for those within our working set. But yeah, well, <laughs> well, NAM does have it. Oh, sure, yes. So essentially, <laughs> you mentioned a little bit about the bias of the, uh, the assemblies we have right now. Yeah, so most of the assemblies are just temporary material um, that's been uh, made available by a massive group of people. But uh, it's just, we're thinking it's just this sort of a clinal difference of the stuff that's been sequenced is temperate material that's being grown in the US as opposed to everything else in the world. So it's, it's sort of, it's, that's why I actually thought of putting that paper from the uh, uh, human genetic side, because you have this working set of uh, European Caucasian people where they're identifying these uh, risk uh, scores. And they're finding that once you add up actually um, the alleles coming from a more diverse group of people that includes people from uh, Eurasia or Africa, they're like completely rescoring them and finding out that what is a rare allele in Europe is completely normal in uh, other populations. It allows you to like not say that something is actually uh, as uh, um, controlling for a given trait as you thought it was. Thanks for coming. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.